Well, we got a lot to cover, but I think we're going to make it. You know, I told you I've never taught the book of Revelation in chronological order in five messages. I've done it in six in times past around the country, but never done it in five. And by God's grace, I believe we're going to actually be able to do it. And not only did I only do it in five messages, I added a message to it this week when I did a whole how to study prophecy part on Sunday morning. So I was a little concerned that we might not be able to get it all in, but praise the Lord, looking at my notes and where I think we're going to hopefully end up tonight and what we got to do tomorrow, I think we're going to make it. So I'm excited. Thank you for coming. Thanks for watching us online. Go ahead and turn in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 11. We're going to be in verses 15 through 19 to get started as we continue jumping around in the book of Revelation to try to study the book of Revelation in chronological order. In Revelation chapter 11, <clears throat> verses 15 through 19, I want you to look closely what the scripture says here. It says, Then the seventh angel blew his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven, saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And the 24 elders who sit on their thrones before God fell on their faces and worshiped God, saying, We give you thanks. We give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, who is and who was, for you have taken your great power and begun to reign. The nations raged, but your wrath came, and the time for the dead to be judged, and for rewarding your servants, the prophets and the saints, and to those who fear your name, both small and great, and for destroying the destroyers of the earth. Then God's temple in heaven was opened, and the ark of his covenant was seen within his temple. There were flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, an earthquake earthquake and heavy hail. Now, <clears throat> this is the seventh trumpet we see here in verse 15. If you remember, there were seven seals, and when the seventh seal was opened, then there were seven trumpets. The seven trumpets have blown, now the seventh trumpet is being blown, and when the seventh trumpet is being blown, as you're going to see tonight, there's going to be seven bowls of God's wrath or seven plagues that are going to be happening on the earth. Things are escalating, getting worse and worse and worse. But there's a couple of things I want to bring out from here real quick. Look at verse 17 again. Now, some of your translations may not point this out, but others of your translations may. The English Standard Version brings this out. American Standard brings this out. Look at verse 17. It says, We give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, who is and who was. What's not there? And who is to come? Why is who is to come not there? Now you say, wait a minute, my Bible says and who is to come. Well, if your Bible says who is to come, that's because your Bible's translating from a group of manuscripts that have that word added. But actually the earliest manuscripts, if, and, and we have many, many, many manuscripts, the earliest manuscripts don't have who is to come. The ones that are closer to our time have added who is to come. But the earliest manuscripts don't have it. Can anybody tell me why? It says who is and who was, but it doesn't say who is to come. Because at this point, he's coming. This is the end of the tribulation period. This is when he's about to show up on the earth. It's not who is to come anymore at this point. Look at what it says. It says, we give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, who is and who was, for you have taken your great power and begun to reign. This is at the end of the tribulation period where Jesus is going to be handed the kingdom. It's the very, very end of the tribulation period. Jump over to Revelation 16. Look at verse 5. You'll see it again. Revelation 16, verse 5. And I heard the angel in charge of the water say, Just are you, o, Hill, o Holy One, who is and who was... What's missing? Doesn't say who is to come. For you brought these judgments, for they have shed the blood of the saints and prophets, and you've given them blood to drink, and it's what they deserve. So again, at the end of the tribulation period, he's no longer described as who was and is and is to come. He's described as who was and who is because he's coming at that time. We also see it here in verse 15. It says, the, king, the seventh angel blew his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ and he shall reign when? Forever and ever. Jump over to Daniel chapter 7. We've been looking a lot at Daniel's prophecy because God gave Daniel a lot of insight into what was going to happen at the end of time. Daniel himself in chapter 12 said, ah, when's this going to be? How's this going to happen? And he was told to seal up the words of the prophecy. It wasn't going to be till the time of the end. Oh, and by the way, if you go double check me and look at Daniel chapter 12, we're going to be in Daniel 7 just now, as you told you to turn Daniel 7. But if you double check me later on in Daniel chapter 12, verse 4, God describes the last of the last days as times when men are going to be able to go to and fro throughout the earth 
and knowledge will increase. By the way, are we not in those days? Think about it this way, folks. The oldest generation alive today has been through more change in their lifetime than any other generation in the history of the world. Those of you that are the oldest generation today have seen more changes technologically, knowledge-wise, everything, than any other generation in the history of the world. Actually, you think back to when Paul's... Uh, 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 sorry, let's back up. Uh, well, yeah, when Paul sailed in his missionary journeys, what was the technology for sailing? Wood ships and sails, right? A thousand years later, almost 1,500 years later, when Columbus sailed, what was the technology for sailing? Wood boats and sails. But in the last 100 years, we've gone from Model A Fords to space shuttles, which are now extinct. You've got more technology on your hip right now with your cell phone than they had in the first lunar launch by a long shot. Knowledge has increased exponentially, just like the Bible said, and men are able to go to and fro throughout the earth. Who would ever thought that I could tell you that as soon as we're done here tomorrow, we're going to be leaving Thursday morning, then we're going to be in Kentucky, and then we're going to be in Ohio, then we're going to be in, in uh, Pennsylvania, and then we're going to be in New Jersey, and then we're going to be back in Florida. Boom, 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 boom. Men are able to go to and fro on airplanes and all this stuff. We are living in the days that Daniel wanted to know about, and Daniel was told it's not going to happen in your life, dime Daniel. You're going to go to sleep with your fathers. You're going to seal up the words of this prophecy. It won't be revealed until the time of the end, but as you're going to see when we get to later on in our study, I believe it's tomorrow night, Daniel is told, sorry, John is told, don't seal up the words of this prophecy. Why? Because it's going to be happening. It's going to be happening. Now, in Daniel chapter 7, look at verses 13 and 14. And I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven there came one like a son of man. And he came to the ancient of days, and he was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. So here in Revelation chapter 11, we've seen that, that word for word almost, it's saying that his kingdom is now an everlasting kingdom And it's his, and it's time, and it's no longer who is to come, because at the end of the tribulation period, God's pouring out his final parts of his wrath on the earth, and Jesus is beginning to reign. Look at chapter 15 now. Go to Revelation 15, verses 1 through 8. In chapter 15, verses 1 through 8. It says, then I saw another sign in heaven with great and amazing, which is great and amazing, seven angels with seven plagues, which are the last, for with them the wrath of God is finished. And I saw what appeared to be a sea of glass mingled with fire, and also those who had conquered the beast in its image and the number of its name, standing beside the sea of glass with harps of God in their hands, and they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and amazing are your deeds, O Lord God the Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the nations. Who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. After this I looked, and the sanctuary of the tent of witness in heaven was opened, and out of the sanctuary came the seven angels with the seven plagues clothed in pure bright linen, with golden sashes around their chests. And one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God, who lives forever and ever. And the sanctuary was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. Power, and no one could enter the sanctuary until the seven plagues of the seven angels were finished. Folks, at this point, the wrath of God is going to be poured out on the earth. As you're going to see, it's going to affect the whole globe all at once. It's going to be so bad at that time that, well, let's just put it to you this way. The scripture says that at that point, nobody goes anywhere near God in heaven at that time. Why? Because of the wrath and the fury and the judgment that's going to be poured out. And everyone in heaven that's all been around the throne I'll just give him some space during this very, very last part of what's going to be happening on the earth. We see now that the seventh trumpet consists of seven plagues or seven bowls of God's wrath. We also see that those who had been killed because they didn't take the mark of the beast and they didn't worship his image are now all in heaven worshiping God and and, uh, they're no longer on the earth. Jump over to chapter 16. Look at verses 1 through 16. We're going to see what happens with the seven bowls. Then I heard a loud voice 
from the temple telling the seven angels, go and pour out on the earth the seven bowls of the wrath of God. So the first angel went and poured out his bowl on the earth and harmful and painful sores came upon the people who bore the mark of the beast and worshipped its image. The second angel poured out his bowl into the sea and it became like blood, the blood of a corpse and every living thing that died, everything living thing died that was in the sea. By the way, how do you think that's going to smell? The third angel poured out his bowl into the rivers and the springs of water, and they became blood. And I heard the angel in charge of the waters say, You're right in doing this, God. Just are you, O holy one, who is and who was, for you brought these judgments. For they have shed the blood of the saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink. It's what they deserve. And I heard the altar saying, Yes, Lord God, the Almighty, true and just are your judgments. The fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and it was allowed to scorch people with fire. They were scorched by the fierce heat, and they cursed the name of God who had power over these plagues. They did not repent and give him glory. The fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, and its kingdom was plunged into darkness. People gnawed their tongues in anguish and cursed the God of heaven for their pain and their sores they did not repent of their deeds the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river euphrates and its water was dried up to prepare the way for the kings from the east and i saw coming out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet three unclean spirits like frogs for they are demonic spirits performing signs who go abroad to the kings of the whole world to assemble them for battle on the great day of God the Almighty. Behold, I'm coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake, keeping his garments on, that he may not go about naked and be seen exposed. And they assembled them at the place that in Hebrew is called Armageddon. Now we're going to just stop here for a second and kind of break some of this down. Now before I break down to chapter 16, I want to show you one quick thing from chapter 15 that I I left off and I want to kind of pull it out again. The Bible says that those people who had not taken the mark of the beast and have been put to death because of their faith during the tribulation period are now in heaven and they're worshiping God. But the Bible also said they're singing the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb. That song of Moses should sound familiar to you. Turn in your Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter 32. I'm not going to read to you the whole song, the whole song in Psalm, uh, Deuteronomy 32, but I want to point it out to you, and we're going to read one section of it because you're going to see it parallels with what's going on in heaven at that time. If you want to go back and look at it later on, it's a fun study. Deuteronomy 32 is a song that God gave Moses, and he wrote it and sang it to the people, and and. It tells the whole story, the whole history of the nation of Israel. From the beginning all the way to the end. It even mentions the church. Look at verse 21, 32, 21. God is going to, he tells the nation of Israel, They have made me jealous with what is no God. They have provoked me to anger with their idols. So I will make them jealous with those who are no people. I'll provoke them to anger with a foolish nation. In other words, if you remember what Paul said in Romans chapter 11, he said that he's saving the Gentiles to make Israel what? Jealous. God said, you know what? You're going to worship these other gods that aren't gods, these false idols that aren't gods to make me jealous? And we're going to see about God's jealousy tonight. He said, I'm going to make you jealous. I'm going to take a people you don't consider a people, the Gentiles, and I'm going to save them by my grace, to make you jealous. But at the end of the song, he's laying out their whole history in this psalm. At the end of the psalm, jump over to verse 39. He says at the very end of the song, See now that I, even I, am he, and there is no God beside me. I kill and I make alive. I wound and I heal, and there is none that can deliver out of my hand. For I lift up my hand to heaven and swear as I live forever, if I sharpen my flashing sword and my hand takes hold on judgment, I will take vengeance on my adversaries, God says, and I will repay those who hate me. I will make my arrows drunk with blood, and my sword shall devour flesh with the blood of the slain and the captives from the long-haired heads of the enemy. Rejoice with him, O heavens. Bow down to him, all gods, for he avenges the blood of his children, and he takes vengeance on his adversaries. He repays those who hate him and cleanses his people's land. By the way, remember, all this is happening because he's opening the, the title deed to the earth and getting the earth back. At the end of the tribulation period, we see with these seven bowls, we see that there's going to be sores, there's going to be the whole sea destroyed, and everything in it is going to die, all the fresh water is destroyed, the sun is going to scorch people. By the way, global warming is going to happen. 
It is going to happen. It ain't happening now, but it is going to happen. Babylon is destroyed, and you're going to see. We're going to, I'm going to show you tonight. Babylon is Babylon. Again, if the Bible doesn't tell you that it's symbolic, take it literally. And I'm going to show you from Scripture that when it says Babylon is going to be destroyed at the end of the time in Revelation, at the end of the tribulation period, it's actually Babylon. We'll get into that tonight. The, also, we see that the battle of the Armageddon that we always hear about, the battle of Armageddon has been started at this point, and it's going to be culminated by Jesus quickly and furiously as he kills everyone in that valley. Uh, go to chapter 16 of Revelation again and look at verses 17 through 21. Revelation 16. Verses 17 through 21. Then the seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and a loud voice came out of the temple from the throne saying, It's done. And there were flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, and a great earthquake, such as there had never been since man was on the earth. So great was that earthquake that the great city, this is Jerusalem, was split into three parts, and the cities of the nations, all the nations on the earth fell, and God remembered Babylon the great to make her drain the cup of the wine of the fury of his wrath. And every island fled away, and no mountains were to be found, and great hailstones, about 100 pounds each, fell from heaven on people, and they cursed God for the plague of the hail, because the plague was so severe." When this last bowl is poured out, a lot happens. There's a great voice from the temple, a great thunder and lightning, a great earthquake, and Jerusalem, the great city, is divided into three parts. Folks, there's going to be an earthquake on the globe at this time that levels Jerusalem. The center part is going to be raised up. The northern part of Jerusalem is going to go flat. The southern part is going to go flat, where the temple area is going to be raised up in the midst of all that. The Bible says the whole earth is going to have an earthquake that levels all the cities on the earth. All the islands are going to disappear. The mountains are going to go. He's just going to level everything and raise Jerusalem up as the center. Well, it's not just said here. Like I've been telling you, the book of Revelation compiles the prophecies from the Old Testament. Go to Zechariah chapter 14. Go to Zechariah chapter 14. Look at verses 1 through 11. In Zechariah chapter 14, God through the prophet Zechariah says, Behold, a day is coming for the Lord when the spoil taken from you will be divided in your midst. For I will gather all the nations against Jerusalem to battle. That's going to be the battle of Armageddon. And the city shall be taken and the houses plundered and women raped. Half of the city shall go into exile, but the rest of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then the Lord will go out and fight against those nations as when he fights on the day of battle. And on that day, his feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives that lies before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west by a very wide valley. So that one half of the mount shall move northward, the other half southward. And you shall flee to the valley of my mountains. For the valley of the mountains shall reach to Azal. And you shall flee as you fled from the earthquake in the days of Uzziah the king of Judah. Then the Lord my God will come and all the holy ones with him. That's us, by the way. On that day, there shall be no light, cold, or frost, and there shall be a unique day, which is known to the Lord, neither day nor night, but at evening time there shall be light. On that day, living waters shall flow out from Jerusalem, half of them to the eastern sea, and half of them to the western sea. The eastern sea is the, sea, uh, the, sorry, the uh, um, Dead Sea, and the western sea is the Mediterranean Sea. It shall continue in summer as in winter. And by the way, the book of Ezekiel shows us that that river is going to be flowing from the temple of God, and it's going to make everything fresh and beautiful. All right? And on the Lord will be king over all the earth. On that day, the Lord will be one, and his name one. The whole land shall be turned into a plain from Geba to Rimmon south of Jerusalem, but Jerusalem shall remain aloft on its site from the gate of Benjamin to the place of the former gate to the corner gate, and from the tower of Hananel to the king's wine presses, and it shall be inhabited, for there shall never again be a decree of utter destruction. Jerusalem shall dwell in security. So the Old Testament prophecy says at the end of the tribulation period, God's going to make an earthquake that levels everything, but Jerusalem will be raised up in the midst of all of that, and God himself is going to come, and he's going to stand on the Mount of Olives, and it's going to split in two, and the millennial kingdom of Jesus' is ruling and reigning on the earth is going to, going to begin at that time. Oh, there's going to be a battle, 
all the nations are going to gather against Jerusalem to fight it. And there's going to be some, some bloodshed at that time, but then God is going to come and he's going to wipe them all out, as you're going to see as we keep reading in our study for tonight. And it, also the Bible says we're going to be coming with him as he comes back to rule and reign on the earth. Now, before we move on to the next section, though, I have to point out something that I've pointed out before, but I want you to see it again because we need to hear this warning. What's the reaction that we've seen again to all the people realizing that God's doing this? Is it repentance? No. They're cursing God. They're not repenting. How in the world? Why? This is very important that you hear this. This is very important that you hear this. The Bible teaches that God is a God of mercy and a God of grace, and he offers salvation. He offers opportunity to be saved. And actually, you can't be saved unless he draws you in the first place, but the Bible teaches that he draws everyone. There are some people that teach he only draws the people that are going to be saved. That's not what the scripture teaches at all. Stephen actually said in Acts chapter 7, he said, you stiff-necked individuals, how long will you resist the Holy Spirit? It's possible to resist the Holy Spirit when he draws you to salvation. John chapter 6 verse 44 says, no one, uh, that no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them first and I'll raise them up on the last day. The very next verse said, as it says in the prophets, this is John chapter 6 verse 45, as it says in the prophets, they all will be taught by God. Whoever listens comes to him. By the way, those of you that have raised children, is there a difference between hearing and listening? Everybody hears. Everybody's given an opportunity for salvation, and God's the one who initiates it. If you're being drawn by the Spirit, it's because God's mercy, it's because you're smart and because you figured it out. If you all of a sudden understand it and you know who Jesus is and what you need to do, God has opened your eyes, and he does it for everyone, but you have a choice. That's why Jesus, in Matthew chapter 23, verse 37, the scripture says he wept over Jerusalem. He said, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, if you'd only let me, I would have gathered you as a mother hen gathers her chicks, but you weren't willing. They had a choice, and that's why judgment fell on Israel for a season. But he'd made promises to the Old Testament patriarchs, and he's going to fulfill them, and they're going to be fulfilled in the last days. He's not done with Israel, but listen to me. There comes a point, the Bible says, that if you reject God's offer of salvation enough, he stops drawing you, and you won't be able to change your mind. Doesn't Romans chapter 1 talk about that? Verses 18 and following, how the wrath of God's being revealed against all ungodliness. The men who suppress the truth, although they knew God, they didn't worship Him as God, but they worshiped images of man and animals and birds and all that stuff. And then the Bible says, because they would not respond, He gives them over. And that's, by the way, the homosexual movement and all that stuff. Romans 1 talks about that. That's one of the evidences that our nation's in trouble. Because God says, you've had your opportunity, I'm going to give you over to your desire and your lusts, and if God doesn't draw you anymore, your time to be saved is over. Listen to me, there are people in here, many people in here, there are people watching online, there comes a point where God says, you've had your opportunity, I'm not drawing you anymore, and when that day comes, you cannot be saved. You will not be saved. And so if you're out there putting it off, don't take that chance. Don't take that chance. Go with me to Hebrews chapter 3. I don't have the time to walk you through it, but if you do want to do a study on your own, you go look at, at uh, um, the story of Pharaoh in Exodus chapter 7. We're heading to Hebrews chapter 3. But you go look at, at Exodus chapter 7, and you'll see that God tells Moses, I'm going to harden Pharaoh's heart. But if you do a study, you'll see over and over it said that Pharaoh hardened his own heart. He hardened his own heart. He hardened his own heart. But there comes a point, it's in chapter 9, where all of a sudden the wording changes, and it says God hardened Pharaoh's heart. God knew he was going to harden his heart, and there came a point where God did it, but God said... I gave him all those opportunities, and he saw all these miracles. He saw all these plagues, but he would not listen. And there came a point where Pharaoh had no choice anymore, and God shut the door. Listen to Hebrews chapter 3, starting in verse 7. Hebrews chapter 3, starting in verse 7. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion on the day of testing in the wilderness, where your fathers put me to the test, God said, and saw my works for 40 years. Therefore, I was provoked with that generation and said, they always go astray in their heart. They have not known my ways. As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. 
Take care, brothers, lest there be any of you in heaven an evil, unbelieving heart, leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day, as long as it's called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. As it is said, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. For who were those who heard and yet rebelled? Was it not all those who left Egypt led by Moses? And with whom was he provoked for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest? But to those who were disobedient. So we see that they were unable to enter because of unbelief. Folks, the reason why the world at that time is going to respond the way they did is because they've had opportunity. And God said, okay, your your time's up. You don't want to get to that point. You don't want to get to that point. Go with me to Revelation chapter 17. We're about to deal with Babylon in chapter 17 and 18 tonight. And I want you to see that the destruction of Babylon has two reasons. And I'm going to show you tonight that it is actually the city of Babylon. It's in Iraq. The first is chapter 17 dealing with Babylon being destroyed for its religious idolatry. And then chapter 18 is going to deal with the destruction of Babylon for its commercial idolatry. Listen to chapter 17, verses 1 through 18. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and said to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great prostitute who is seated on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed sexual immorality, and with the wine of whose sexual immorality the dwellers on earth have become drunk. And he carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was full of blasphemous names, and it had seven heads and ten horns. Does that sound familiar? That's the Antichrist kingdom. Remember the seven heads and the ten horns? That's the Antichrist kingdom. The final kingdom is going to be a one-world government in the end, in in the last days. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet, adorned with gold and jewels and pearls, and holding in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the impurities of her sexual immorality. And on her forehead was written a name of mystery, Babylon the Great, mother of prostitutes and of earth's abominations. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints, the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. When I saw her, I marveled greatly, but the angel said to me, Why do you marvel? I'll tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast with the seven heads and ten horns that carries her. Again, symbolism is explained. The beast that you saw was and is not and is about to rise from the bottomless pit and go to destruction. And the dwellers on earth whose names have not been written in the book of life from the foundation of the world will marvel to see the beast because it was and is not and is to come. This calls for a mind with wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman is seated. They are also seven kings, five of whom have fallen. One is, the other has not yet come. And when he does come, he must remain only a little while. As for the beast that was and is not, it's an eighth. But it belongs to the seven and it goes to destruction. And the ten horns that you saw are ten kings who have not yet received royal power. But they are to receive authority as kings for one hour together with the beast. We've already studied all that. These are of one mind and they hand over their power and authority to the beast. And they will make war on the lamb. And the lamb will conquer them for he is the Lord of lords and the king of kings. And those who with him are called chosen and faithful. And the angel said to me, the waters that you saw where the prostitute is seated are peoples, multitudes, nations, and languages. And the ten horns that you saw, they and the beast will hate the prostitute. They'll make her desolate and naked and devour her flesh and burn her up with fire. For God has put it into their hearts to carry out his purpose by being of one mind and handing over their royal power to the beast until the words of God are fulfilled. And the woman that you saw, this is the woman on the beast is the great city that has dominion over the kings of the earth. And as you're going to see, it is literally Babylon. I'm going to show you that tonight. But first of all, I want you to understand, God sees worshiping anyone else but him as unfaithfulness, idolatry, adultery. You'll see those terms used all through the scriptures. Go with me real quick to Deuteronomy chapter 6. Let me just kind of lay this foundation for you. Deuteronomy chapter 6. We're going to look at verses 1 through 9, and then we're going to jump to verses 14 and 15. 
back when God was revealing himself and revealing who he was and his, his, his heart for the people of Israel is revealing himself to the nation of Israel. It says in Deuteronomy 6, verses 1 through 9, Now this is the commandment, the statutes, and the rules that the Lord your God commanded me to teach you, that you may do them in the land to which you're going over to possess it, that you may fear the Lord your God, you and your son and your son's son, by keeping all his statutes and his commandments, which I command you all the days of your life, and that your days may be long. Hear, therefore, O Israel, and be careful to do them, that it may go well with you, and that you may multiply greatly, as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has promised you in a land flowing with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words that I command you today should be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Jump down to verse 14. You shall not go after other gods, the gods of the peoples who are around you, for the Lord your God in your midst is a jealous God, lest the anger of the Lord your God be kindled against you and he destroy you from off the face of the earth. By the way, has Israel been unfaithful to God over the years? Big time. Why do they still exist then? Why does Israel still exist? Because he's made a promise that he would never totally wipe them off the face of the earth. That's why in Malachi chapter 3, I think it's around verse 10, God says, I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore, you, O Israel, are not destroyed. The only reason Israel still exists is because God made a promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and he's going to fulfill it. Oh, he put them on hold for a season. He kicked them out of the land two or three times and then ultimately for a while. But now he's brought them back to fulfill the promises in the last days. And the prophecies are saying that everything that's about to happen that we're studying in Revelation, the stage is all being set. The world hates Israel. Israel's in the land, but they're not worshiping the Lord like the scripture is going to show us. At the end, they will. When God comes and he sets up his kingdom, when all this stuff happens, all this stuff happens on the globe, and those of Israel that believes and aren't killed are running into the wilderness and protected, they're going to look on him whom they pierced. They're going to change their heart. And you're going to see the prophecy show us tonight that when God does this, from that day forth, Israel will worship the Lord. It's not happened yet. But the stage has been set. Everything's in place. The church is going to be taken away at some point. I believe it's close. But then after that, this seven-year period that was prophesied to Daniel, that last seven-year period is yet to be fulfilled. And let me just tell you, folks, all this stuff that we've been reading about and studying in Revelation is going to happen. These things must take place. Now, go to James chapter 4. You'll see God has that same attitude of jealousy toward us. If we're unfaithful to him and worship other things like the world. Look at James chapter 4 verses 4 and 5. James says, you adulterous people. There's that term again. You adulterous people. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you suppose that it's to no purpose that the scripture says he yearns jealously over the spirit that he's made to dwell in us? Folks, that's why this woman on the beast, which is, by the way, false religion that has started years ago in Babylon. I don't have the time to take you back there. But if you go back and take a look at Genesis chapter 11, you'll see in Genesis chapter 11 that this man Nimrod built a big city there in, in, in Shinar, the plain of Shinar. It's called Babylon. And it's the place where they said, we don't want to be scattered over the whole earth. By the way, God had already told Adam and Eve and he told mankind, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Oh, they get to chapter 11 and they say, we don't want to be scattered across the whole earth. Let's make a name for ourselves. And they built the big city. They built that tower that would reach to the heavens. And remember, God scattered them because he confused their languages. And that's why they called it Babel and all that stuff. But if you do even more study, you'll find later on the prophecy in there keeps talking about this man Nimrod. And you do a little more research, you'll find out that he married this lady Semiramis. And they started teaching false religion. And all false worship of idols started in Babylon. And God said in the very last days, he's going to bring a judgment on Babylon because of it. You say, wait a minute, Jim. Uh, The Bible said that Babylon was to be destroyed, never to be inhabited again. You're right. When the final prophecies are fulfilled, it will be destroyed, never to be inhabited again. We're going to see a couple of those tonight. 
But on top of that, let me ask you a question. When God judged Babylon and the Medes and the Persians came in, did the Medes and the Persians wipe out Babylon and no one could live there anymore? Or did they take over and live there? They took over and lived there. So that couldn't have been the fulfillment of the destruction of Babylon, which the prophecies all say one day it will be destroyed, never to be inhabited again. Some of you are old enough to remember the Gulf War stuff. Remember how we went after Saddam Hussein? By the way, do you all know that during the time before Saddam Hussein was captured and killed, that actually he was rebuilding Babylon? Do you all know that after Babylon, sorry, after Saddam Hussein's been removed, Babylon, you do a little research, you'll find billions and billions of oil dollars have gone in there now because Saddam's not there. And actually one of the biggest U.S. embassies is being built right there. And Babylon is becoming a place of world population and tourism and all this stuff. And the Bible actually told us back in Zechariah chapter 5 that the headquarters for iniquity and wickedness in the whole globe is that the last day is going to be centered in Babylon. Go there to Zechariah chapter 5. I want you to see it for yourself. We're going to go to Zechariah chapter 5, verse 5. So when I talk to you about the destruction of Babylon, please understand that it is still coming. Zechariah chapter 5, starting in verse 5. Then the angel who talked with me came forward and said to me, lift your eyes and see what this is that is going out. And I said, what is it? He said, this is the basket that is going out. And he said, this is their iniquity in all the land. And behold, the leaden cover was lifted and there was a woman sitting in the basket. And he said, this is wickedness. And he thrust her back into the basket and thrust down the leaden weight on its opening. And then I lifted my eyes and I saw and behold, two women coming forward. By the way, only place in the Bible where angels are shown as women. To women coming forward, the wind was in their wings, and they had wings like the wings of a stork, and they lifted up the basket between earth and heaven. Then I said to the angel who talked with me, where are they taking the basket? He said to me, to the land of Shinar, to build a house for it, and when this is prepared, they will set the basket down there on its base. The Bible says that the headquarters for all iniquity in all the land is going to be centered in Babylon, the land of Shinar, the plain of Shinar, according to Genesis chapter 11. Folks... The woman on the beast is the city of Babylon. Go back to Revelation 17. Look at verse 5 and then at verse 18. Revelation 17, verse 5. On her forehead was written the name of mystery, Babylon the great, the mother of prostitutes and of the earth's abominations. And then verse 18. And the woman that you saw is the great city that is dominion over the kings of the earth. You put the two verses together. Who's the woman on the beast? It's Babylon. But it's religious idolatry that's come out of Babylon. And they're going to be destroyed. But not only that. You remember how I've told you that we get the false trinity. There's Satan who's come to the earth, the dragon. There's the Antichrist, which is the beast. And then there's the false prophet, which is the other beast. And the false prophet's making everyone worship the Antichrist and worship the beast. Well, the Bible actually says that there's going to come a point where all of a sudden the beast, sorry, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet are all going to change. And they're going to turn against this one world religion that there's going to be on the earth. And they're going to make everybody Worship the Antichrist. Look again at Revelation 13. Look again at Revelation 13. Verses 5 through 8. So for a period there's going to be a one world religion, but then it's going to all turn to either worship the beast or you're dead. Revelation 13 verses 5 through 8. And the beast was given a mouth uttering haughty and blasphemous words and was allowed to exercise authority for 42 months. It opened its mouth to utter blasphemies against God and blaspheming his name and his dwelling, that is, those who dwell in heaven. All, it also was allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them. And authority was given it over every tribe and people and language and nation. And all who dwell on the earth will worship it, everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who was slain. Jump over to chapter 17. Look at verses 16 and 17. And the ten horns that you saw, remember that's the one, the, the, the one world government. The ten horns that you saw, they and the beast will hate the prostitute, and they will make her desolate and naked and devour her flesh and burn her up with fire. For God's put it in their hearts to carry out his purpose by being of one mind and handing over their royal power to the beast until the words of God are fulfilled. Now it goes on and it says here that there are, you know, seven kings, five who were, one who is, and one who's still to come. Well, that's Egypt is the first one. 
Second one is Assyria, was the one world power. Then there was Babylon. Then there were the Medes and the Persians. Then there was Greece. The one who is at the time that John was writing this is Rome. But there's still one more to come. One more one world government. We've already studied all that. It's going to be made up of ten kingdoms and ten kings. But then there's going to be a one that comes up and he's going to subdue three of them. And he's going to become the one. And all those other kings are going to give him their authority. This is all going to make a whole lot more sense if you're here on the earth. But you'd probably rather watch it with John from up above, wouldn't you? But let me just tell you, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. We can still pray against it and hope that we can be salt on this earth while we're still here. But there is coming a one world government. It's not going to be stopped. The Bible's very, very clear. Now, the Antichrist kingdom, as we've already seen, is going to be made up of these 10 kingdoms. And if you want to double check me, go back to Daniel 7, 23 through 25. Let's jump over to chapter 18 now, though. Babylon itself is not only going to be destroyed because of religious idolatry that started there and the worship of false gods and, and worshiping anything but God. It's also going to be destroyed for commercial adultery. And I'll show you what I mean by that. Go to Revelation 18. Look at verses 1 through 24. After this, I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having a great authority. And the earth was made bright with his glory. And he called out with a mighty voice, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has become a dwelling place for demons, a haunt for every unclean spirit, a haunt for every unclean bird, a haunt for every unclean and detestable beast. For all nations have drunk the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality, that's false religion, and the kings of the earth have committed immorality with her, and the merchants of the earth have grown rich from the power of her luxurious living. Then I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you take part in her sins, lest you share in her plagues, for her sins are heaped up, heaped high as heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. Pay her back as she herself has paid back others, and repay her double for her deeds. Mix a double portion for her in the cup she mixed. As she glorified herself and lived in luxury, so give her a like measure of torment and mourning, since in heart, she says, I sit as queen, I'm no widow, and mourning I shall never see. For this reason, her plagues will come in a single day. Don't miss that. Death and mourning and famine, and she will be burned up with fire. For mighty is the Lord God who has judged her. And the kings of the earth who committed sexual, sexual immorality and lived in luxury with her will weep and wail over her when they see the smoke of her burning. They will stand far off in fear of her torment and say, Alas, alas, you great city, you mighty city Babylon, for in a single hour your judgment has come. And the merchants of the earth weep and mourn for her since no one buys their cargoes anymore. Cargoes of gold, silver, jewels, pearls, fine linen, purple cloth, silk, scarlet cloth, all kinds of scented wood, all kinds of articles of ivory, all kinds of articles of costly wood, bronze, iron, and marble, cinnamon, spice, incense, myrrh, frankincense, wine, oil, fine flour, wheat, cattle, and sheep, and horses, and chariots, and slaves, that is, human souls. For the fruit the fruit for which your soul longed has gone from you, and all your delicacies and your splendors are lost to you, never to be found again. The merchants of these wares who gained wealth from her will stand far off in fear of her torment, weeping and mourning aloud. Alas, alas, for the great city that was clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet, adorned with gold, with jewels and with pearls. For in a single hour, all this wealth has been laid waste. Listen closely. And all shipmasters and seafaring men, sailors and all whose trade is on the sea, stood far off and cried out as they saw the smoke of her burning. Hang on for a second. People have said, Jim, that's proof that it can't be Babylon. Babylon's 300 miles from the nearest coast. What did the prophecy say? Only the ones who were there around the coast or every ship merchant on the whole globe? All of them. They don't have to be right there watching her burn from their ships. It's just saying all the ships, make, all the ships, sorry, sailors and people that have made their merchandise from them doesn't have to be on a coast. They say, what city was like the great city? And they threw dust on their heads as they wept and mourned, crying out, Alas, alas, for the great city, where all who had ships at sea grew rich by her wealth. For in a single hour she has been laid waste. Rejoice over her, O heaven, and you saints and apostles and prophets, for God has given judgment for you against her. 
Then a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and threw it into the sea. Don't miss that. A mighty angel took a stone and threw it into the sea. So will Babylon, the great city, be thrown down with violence and will be found no more. And the sound of harpists and musicians and flute players and trumpeters will be heard in you no more. And the craftsmen of any craft will be found in you no more. And the sound of the mill will be heard in you no more. And the light of a lamp will shine in you no more. And the voice of the bridegroom and bride will be heard in you no more. For your merchants were the great ones of the earth, and all nations were deceived by your sorcery. And in her was found the blood of the prophets and of the saints and all who have been slain on the earth. Folks, here is the final destruction of the city of Babylon itself, and it's going to happen at the end of the tribulation period. Somehow, between now and when this all comes to be, Babylon's going to become the head of world headquarters, commerce, everything. And as you know, there's lots of billions of dollars that are already there because of oil and all that stuff. And everything in the globe is going to be centered in Babylon. And God, it started there. Idolatry started there. And he's going to let Babylon be rebuilt one more time. And it's being rebuilt. And he's going to bring a destruction on it in the last days. But don't just take Revelation. Go back with me to Isaiah chapter 13. I don't have time tonight to show you all the places. I actually did a full study on this, and I found 50 prophecies in the Old Testament. I said that, 5-0, 50 prophecies in the Old Testament that prophesy about the destruction of Babylon. And you'll see some of them describe the Medes and the Persians. They were going to Isaiah 13. Some describe the Medes and the Persians, but others are obviously not being done by man. It's being done by God. In Isaiah 13, look at verses 1 and following. The oracle concerning who? Babylon, which Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw. On a bare hill, raise a single signal. Cry aloud to them. Wave the hand for them to enter the gates of the nobles. I myself have commanded my consecrated ones and have summoned my mighty men to execute my anger, my proudly exulting ones. The sound of a tumult is on the mountains as a great multitude. The sound of an uproar of kingdoms, of nations gathering together. The Lord of hosts is mustering a host for battle. They come from a distant land, from the ends of the heavens, the Lord and the weapons of his indignation to destroy the whole land. Wail, for the day of the Lord is near as destruction from the Almighty. It will come. Therefore, all hands will be feeble, and every human heart will melt. They'll be dismayed. Pangs and agony will seize them. They'll be in anguish like a woman in labor. They'll look aghast at one another. Their faces will be aflame. Behold, the day of the Lord comes, cruel with wrath and fierce anger, to make the land a desolation and to destroy its sinners from it. For the stars of the heavens and their constellations will not give their light. The sun will be dark as it's rising. The moon will not shed its light. I will punish the world for its evil and the wicked for their iniquity. I'll put an end to the pomp of the arrogant and lay low the pompous pride of the ruthless. And I'll make people more rare than fine gold and mankind than the gold of Ophir. Therefore, I'll make the heavens tremble and the earth will be shaken out of its place at the wrath of the host. Sorry, at the wrath of the Lord of hosts in the day of his fierce anger. Now you've been with me all along. Does that not sound like everything we've been reading? All the things that we've been seeing prophesied in Revelation are going to be happening when God judges Babylon. Jump over to verse 19. And Babylon, the glory of kingdoms, the splendor and pomp of the Chaldeans will be like Sodom and Gomorrah when God overthrew them. It will never be inhabited or lived in for all generations. No Arab will pitch his tent there. No shepherds will make their flocks lie down there. But wild animals will lie down there and their houses will be full of howling creatures. Their ostriches will dwell and their wild goats will dance. Hyenas will cry in its towers and jackals in the pleasant palaces. Its time is close at hand, and its days will not be prolonged. Jump over to chapter 14. Look at verses 22 and following. I will rise up against them, declares the Lord of hosts, and will cut off from Babylon name and remnant descendants and posterity, declares the Lord. And I'll make it a possession of the hedgehog and pools of water. I will sweep it with the broom of destruction, declares the Lord. Folks, Write this down. Double check me later on. Don't take anything I'm saying as gospel. Examine everything I say against the scriptures. But if you go look at Jeremiah 50 and Jeremiah 51, two whole chapters com just composed of the destruction that is coming on Babylon. Parts of those prophecies are going to be hinting at what the Medes and the Persians were going to do as they were going to come in and take over. But they're not totally fulfilled with the Medes and the Persians because the Medes and the Persians came and dwelt there. As you know, Daniel worked for the Babylonian king. And then when they were removed during his time period by the Medes and the Persians, Daniel worked for the Medes and the Persian kings. 
But their prophecies say that there's going to come a time where Babylon is going to be the center of everything and it's going to be ultimately destroyed. And as we've been reading, it's going to happen at the very end of the tribulation period because it's one of the bowls. It's one of the bowls in the seventh trumpet. So it's going to happen at that time. It's happening now. Babylon's being rebuilt. So two, I think two of the seven wonders of the world are actually there. Do a little research. You'll find Babylon's coming back. And at one point, I don't know if it's after the rapture of the church or at some point, somehow, all of a sudden, everything in the globe is going to be centered there. And God's going to let it happen. Because that's where it all started when that man turned against him. And that's where all false religion came from and commercialism. You know, the Bible says, don't store up for yourself treasure on earth. And it also says you, in Matthew chapter 6, verse 24, you can't serve both God and money. You've got to choose. Yet, it's going to become the center of all the wealth, everything. By the way, if you were to, and I don't have to take a time to walk you through that, if you would compare Revelation 18, verses 4 and 6, look again at Revelation chapter 18, verses 4 through 6. Where it says, I heard a voice from heaven saying, come out of her, my people. And you go look at, at Jeremiah 51. Remember I told you all of chapter 50 and 51 of Jeremiah. Jer write it down. Jeremiah 51 verses 45 through 64. You're going to see it's almost word for word what you read in Revelation. And not only that, if you look at Revelation 18, 21 through 24. Revelation 18, 21 through 24. This, then a mighty angel picked up a stone and the great millstone and threw it into the sea. You go back and look at that passage I told you about in Jeremiah 51, 45 through 64. It's word for word. So, folks, let me just tell you, we've heard people say for years, oh, the Bible said this and the Bible said that. Yeah, but they're taking a verse here and a verse there. Use the whole of Scripture, folks. I was telling the pastor beforehand, if I wanted to, I could take 10 minutes, 15 minutes, and I could take Scripture tonight, and I could convince you all that there's no such thing as a literal millennial kingdom where Jesus is going to rule, the, on, rule and reign on the earth. That's the all-millennial view, that there is no actual millennial kingdom. I could take scripture and prove it to you tonight in 10 minutes. Problem is, I would be leaving off a lot of the Bible. See, I can make the Bible say certain things. And there's lots of people out there who say, look at this verse. I am here to encourage you. I hope you've started to get the idea that God's wired me in a different way. And the fact that I could quote to you most of the Bible, it's not because I've sat and memorized it. There's no impressiveness about Jim Johnson. My wife will tell you. She's here. My kids will tell you. They always jokingly say in our house, if you ask dad a question that starts with, do you remember, the answer is no. Because my memory is pretty bad. I don't remember stuff real well. I don't win many arguments with my wife that way because she's probably right. I don't remember it. But God has supernaturally gifted me to pretty much have the Bible from Genesis to Revelation in my head and in my heart. And as I've studied the whole of Scripture, and I look at passages, Genesis will come up, and Revelation, and Zechariah, and Zephaniah, and these passages, and when you put them all together, not a verse here and a verse there, when you put them all together, you come to realize the only view of all the views that are out there that works with the whole of Scripture is the fact that there's going to be a rapture of the church prior to the tribulation period. That there's going to be a literal seven-year tribulation period on the earth. And then there's going to be a literal millennial kingdom where Jesus rules and reigns on the earth. We're going to talk about that tomorrow night. Can't wait. Come tomorrow night. Tomorrow night's going to be a whole lot more fun. We've been looking at death and plagues and bowls and wrath. Tomorrow night, we're going to celebrate. Tomorrow night, we're going to have a party. But tonight, we're going to look at the hallelujahs starting. Go to Revelation chapter 19. I'm going to give you a little quiz tonight. Look at Revelation 19, verses 1 through 5. After all this, remember this is the seventh trumpet and the, seventh, and the seven bowls. After this, I heard what seemed to be the loud voice of a great multitude in heaven crying out, Hallelujah! Salvation and glory and power belong to our God. For his judgments are true and just, for he has judged the great prostitute who corrupted the earth with her immorality and has avenged on her the blood of her servants. Once more they cried out, 
Hallelujah! The smoke from her goes up forever and ever. And the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshipped God who was seated on the throne saying, Amen! Hallelujah! And from the throne came a voice saying, Praise our God, all you his servants, you who fear him, small and great. Now we're going to skip verses 6 through 10 because we're going to deal with them tomorrow night. But let me give you a little quiz. I want you to just throw some numbers out. How many times do you think the word hallelujah is in the Bible? Very good. This man knows. There's only four times. Most people say 20, 50, 100, 1,000. The word hallelujah is only in the Bible four times. The three that I just read, and look at verse 6. Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters, and like the sound of mighty pearls of thunder, crying out, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Now, we'll deal with verses 6 through 10 tomorrow night. But let me just tell you, at this point, even though the destruction is happening, the battle of Armageddon is being waged and all that, Jesus is coming back at this point, and he's going to set up his kingdom on the earth. Oh, it's going to be bloody between now and then. It's going to be pretty bloody between now and then. Let's jump to chapter 19, though, and look at verses 11 through 21. Then I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. The one sitting on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, and he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He's clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the Word of God. And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun. With a loud voice, he called to all the birds that fly directly overhead, Come, gather for the great supper of God, to eat the flesh of the kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and their riders, the flesh of all men, both free and slave, both small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth with their armies gather to make war against him who was sitting on the horse and against his army. And the beast was captured, and with it the false prophet, who in its presence had done the signs by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped its image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire that burned with sulfur, and the rest were slain by the sword that came from the mouth of him who was seated on the horse, and all the birds were gorged with their flesh. Here we see Jesus riding back. Now Jesus is coming back to the earth this time. He's coming on a white horse, and they make it real clear that it's him. His robe's dipped in blood. His name's the word of the God. The sword's coming out of his mouth, just like we saw in Revelation 1. And he's going to rule the nations with a rod of iron, just like the prophecies in the Old Testament said. And who's coming with him? We are. But you'll notice, there's no blood on us. We're all dressed in white, white and white horses, and there's no blood on us. You know why? Because he's doing it all himself. Let me just say something to you, folks. This time here, I believe, is the culmination of the battle that we, a lot of prophecy people like to talk about, the battle of Gog and Magog in Ezekiel 38 and 39. A lot of prophecy people, guys that I know and love and respect, actually think that the battle of Gog and Magog is going to happen prior to the tribulation period. I personally think the battle of Gog and Magog is going to begin about the midpoint of the tribulation, culminating in the battle of Armageddon. Because as I've studied it, I've come to realize that the battle of Gog and Magog in Ezekiel 38 and 39 parallels word for word with what we just read here. Let me show you what I mean. Go to, go to Ezekiel 39. Go to Ezekiel 39. Look at verses 17 through 24. This is in the, pro- the prophecy about the battle of Gog and Magog. As for you, Ezekiel 39, 17, as for you, son of man, thus says the Lord God, speak to the birds of every sort and to all beasts of the field, assemble and come, gather from all around to the sacrificial feast that I'm preparing for you, a great sacrificial feast on the mountains of Israel, and you shall eat flesh and drink blood, you shall eat the flesh of the mighty, drink the blood of the princes of the earth, of rams and lambs and he goats and bulls and all of them fat beasts of Bashan, and you shall eat fat till you are filled and drink blood till you're drunk at the sacrificial feast that I'm preparing for you, and you shall be filled at my table with horses and charioteers, 
with mighty men and all kinds of warriors, declares the Lord God. Did you see that? Tell them the birds, just like we saw in Revelation 19, come eat all the flesh. Because there's going to be such a, a bloodshed there at the Battle of Armageddon. In the Valley of Megiddo, there outside of Jerusalem. And look at what it says. And I will set my glory among the nations, and all the nations shall see my judgment that I've executed, and my hand that I have laid on them. The house of Israel shall know that I am the Lord their God from that day forward. And the nations shall know that the house of Israel went into captivity for their iniquity because they dealt so treacherous with me that I hid my face from them and gave them into the hand of their adversaries and they all fell by the sword. I dealt with them according to their uncleanness and their transgressions and hid my face from them. So here the Bible says that when this battle of Gog and Magog happens, when this battle of Armageddon, I believe, happens, from that point forward, Israel will worship the Lord. If the battle of Gog and Magog happens prior to the tribulation period, Israel's going to sign a deal with the Antichrist for a while. It won't be till the midpoint of the tribulation that they go, oh, dip, we made a mistake, and they have to run for their lives. But the prophecy shows that the battle of Gog and Magog, Ezekiel 39, verses 17 and following, is word for word with Revelation 19 when Jesus comes back and he sets up his kingdom. And he tells the birds, drink the blood eat the flesh of captains and all that and the charioteers and all that. Listen to me, folks. The Bible actually says in the Old Testament prophecies, and you're going to see it as well. We may get to it tomorrow. I don't know. We're running out of time tonight. That the blood is going to be so deep in that valley during this battle that Jesus fights for himself that it's going to be as high as a horse's bridle for almost 180 miles, which, by the way, is the length of the Valley of Megiddo. All this stuff is going to happen. It's symbolic. Now, we're going to stop for tonight. And tomorrow, we're going to finish everything up. I can't wait to show you the celebration that's about to occur. But I'm going to give you a little commercial for tomorrow so that you'll come back. I want to show you where I believe the prophecies tell us the Jews are going to hide in the wilderness. I think the Bible actually tells us exactly where they're going to be hiding in the wilderness during that time. And I, for years, thought that Jesus, when he comes back to the earth, was going to just go straight to the Mount of Olives. We already read that he's going to stand on the Mount of Olives and it's going to split in two. And we also know in Acts chapter 1, he ascended from the Mount of Olives and the angel said, this same Jesus will come back in the same way. For years, I thought that when Jesus came back, he came back to the Mount of Olives first. I'm going to show you that the scripture actually tells us very clearly in three different places in the Old Testament that he doesn't come first to the Mount of Olives. But he comes to this place where the Jews are going to be hiding and he reveals himself to them there. And from there, he leads his army, and he defeats all the people in the valley of Megiddo and the battle of Armageddon on his way to Jerusalem. And then he ascends the Mount of Olives, and the millennial kingdom will begin. I'll tell you where that is tomorrow night if you come or if you're watching online. I love you. Thanks for coming.